societies, people were also philosophical. They were conversational. They were thinking about things. And one of Raiden's points is that in every society, there's going to be people who are skeptical, right? There's going to be people who don't want to believe things or talk different or think differently. But in what, what do we make of such people? And as Gabe says, in, in other societies, Raiden was struck by how people in other societies, what we might once call primitive societies, had a high tolerance for the nonconformists, a high tolerance for the eccentric. And uh, Beidelman pushed that one step further when he was talking about the new era. This is a cover of a different book he wrote about. But you can see the kind of the idea he had, the moral imagination Kaguru modes of thought. And the idea, I probably shouldn't use the word weirdos. That's a little bit, maybe not the right word to use today. Anomalous individuals, people who might look a little strange, talk a little strange, might even become uh, prophets or leaders at certain times. So maybe most of the time you ignore them and they're off mumbling to themselves. But during times of political crisis, they might be called upon to remake society so gabe you said we don't tolerate eccentrics in our in our world very much <laughs> yeah we're kind of mean usually I, mean, I don't think i maybe we're getting better i hope maybe we are getting better about this but i feel like as a general rule it is true that uh Modern society has doesn't doesn't like eccentrics very much. So this is a really interesting point. It'll come up later about uh, to describe some of those burials. Now uh, they then uh, go into talking about the work of perhaps one of the most famous anthropologists of all time, uh, especially if you're French, uh, Claude Levi Strauss, uh, like probably unequaled in terms of, of fame around the world. And uh, actually, Gabe, this is your favorite book, right? <laughs> ah, heck, did you, why? Did you get a chance to look at it? <laughs> yes, we, 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 uh, this was the, the prize, the prize last year for being our nominee for JCH. Um, this is actually a book that was once called, and uh, Graeber and Wengro call it by its original translated name. It was called the Savage Mind. The Savage Mind, and um, on the one hand, Levi Strauss was a revolutionary thinker who in French society and other societies made the radical claim that in fact, in other what we call primitive or savage societies, they were equally mentally capacitated, had equal mental capacities and could debate and converse and, and that there was nothing distinctive about the about the modern or the contemporary mode of thought. Um, the book was originally in translated into English as uh, as Savage Mind, which the Savage Mind, which is almost goes against what he was actually saying, and it is something of a mistranslation of the phrase in French. And so there's a new translation that came out a couple years ago. Uh, and so they translate it instead as wild thought, which is closer, I think, to what uh, Levi Strauss was trying to do and better translated in general and more like what he was trying to say. In this, in this uh, reflection, they talk a little bit about the savage mind. But they were talking about an article that he wrote about the Nambiquara in, in the Amazon, in the Brazilian uh, Amazon. And what Levi Strauss was saying is that they seemed to jump back and forth or move seasonally. Sometimes they'd be hunters and gatherers, 
And then they'd be farmers for a while, and then they'd seasonally shift between hunting and gathering and farming. And uh, what our Graeber and Wengrow claim is that although Levi Strauss was super famous and super important, his article on the Nambiquara was basically ignored. Now, some people say that it was ignored because Levi Strauss was very smart and a very good writer and an incredible thinker, but he was not really known for his fieldwork skills. And so he didn't seem to uh, have spent very much time there. So that's why some people say it's ignored. But uh, according to Graeber and Wengro, it got ignored mostly because it came out at a time when there was a new paradigm developing about the stages of both political and social development. And so people were starting to link up this idea of how uh, social societies evolved from hunters to uh, hunters to herders to farmers and link that to political forms. And so what Graeber and Wengro are saying is that the idea that there were these political chiefs who thought about this and could transition their society from one state to another did not fit into this evolutionary schema, which was being developed in the 1960s and, and 70s. And so basically people ignored this idea that, that there were people, many people who shifted between foraging and, uh, and farming seasonally. And so, uh, you know, they talk about uh, Levi Strauss on the Nambiquara and these political chiefs and how they were, in, in fact, sometimes anon anomalous individuals. And I wanted to give you a sense. This was from my intro class and uh, just of how these these terms are still being used today. And they do they do sort of form a kind of paradigm. So I talk about how we have this. Uh, I don't want to call it evolution, but certainly the, these most people in archaeology believe that, you know, we had this stage of hunting and gathering or foraging, and then you have pastoralism, and then you have horticulture, and then you have agriculture. Now, uh, sometimes I like to point out that oftentimes pastoralism, fully pastoralist societies uh, appeared after agriculture and are only uh, only possible because of the trade between them. But I think you can see that by sort of lining these up in most intro textbooks, we preserve this sense that people go from hunting and gathering to herding to small-scale farming to large-scale farming or more intensive uh, agriculture. Now, we try in anthropology to get away from the idea that this is a progression, that this is a form of progress, and we sometimes say that, aha, actually people who live in foraging societies have more leisure time and all the things that we talked about. But we nevertheless still preserve this idea of stages or social forms. And that is linked to or correlated with ideas about political forms that foraging societies generally live in small bands, that pastoral societies correspond to what archaeologists call tribes, that small-scale uh, farming or horticulture corresponds to chiefdoms, and that it is with agriculture that you see the emergence of state government. And so, again, although people get antsy about some of these terms. For example, I don't like the idea that people are called tribes because that has all kinds of meanings outside of anthropology and archaeology. And I try to say that these are not tightly bound together. It isn't that every time their people are pastoralists, they're going to organize themselves as a tribe, etc. Nevertheless, many intro textbooks, including the one I use now, make this correlation. For me, this is one of the problems with my intro textbook right now is they make this too tightly for my for my understanding. But it's certainly the the paradigm that is with us today. Again, we've tried to get out of the idea that this is a progression and we try to qualify it in all kinds of ways, but it nevertheless 
persists with us that societies move through these stages, whether they are evolving or transitioning or or changing between the, but they are they can be classified or grouped under these uh, different social, political, and economic forms. Now, we'll get back to that in a second, but after that, Graber and Wengro talk to us about, they go back into those burials that we uh, started discussing uh, in the last class, which are these, you know, these, well, Liz, what are these burials like? Who is actually buried here during this Ice Age period? Up the body. Yeah, that's a really interesting point about this is, you know, the kind of idea that the perhaps these are these are powerful beings and you want to keep the soul inside by covering them up with all these ornaments and things like that. But I guess what kind of what what kind of Physically, what kind of people get buried in the ice age here, or what 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 types of individuals when we look at their bones and stuff? I don't know if you. There's uh, it's on page 102 and 103, basically saying that that most of the burials that we see are people who are anatomically unusual. And so in the last class, we talked about somebody who has had probably congenital uh, genetic dwarfism was unusually short, but they'd have all these physical anomalies. And so basically what they're saying here is that in fact, uh, that probably the people that were buried were probably those unusual eccentric types. Maybe they were like the new air prophets. And so one of the things that definitely is not, or they say cannot be happening here, and the archeologists often say that when people are buried, especially with all these wealth objects like Liz has described, that that's an evidence that there's some sort of heritable hierarchy or some sort of social inequality being manifested uh, in the burials of these individuals. Liz, what do they say about this hierarchy thing? Yeah, that in fact, there's no evidence that this is a, you know, just because there, there are funny children buried with a bunch of wealth objects, those are the only burials. So there isn't evidence that there was some sort of social stratification going on and that these were, uh, and, and, that, and that they were uh, being, being a, a stratified elite. So on page 103, uh, it says, it seems extremely unlikely that Paleolithic Europe produced a stratified elite that just happened to consist largely of hunchbacks, giants, and dwarfs. Second, uh, well, you know, we, we're not dealing with uh, a, a case of some people being buried with rich grave goods and others being buried with none. Uh, it's that they're the only people that are buried are the ones that have rich grave goods. So they, we can't use these to describe a some sort of uh, stratified hierarchy from that time. Now, they then go back and talk about um, the monumental architecture that's been found at the time. Matt, where is this?
Yeah. <laughs> what do you make of this? Yeah, it's pretty wild. And people have been getting all excited about whether there's, you know, there's, I guess there's some skull stuff going on and there's all kinds of animals here. And, and the thing is that what's really super interesting about this site is that it doesn't seem to have been built by uh, farmers, by people who had agriculture. And so we have this crazy monumental site with this architecture and, and, pretty amazing art, but it seems like it is another example, or I mean, a, an example of seasonality where people are coming together out of the ice age, getting a lot of stuff, getting those mammoth tusks and then and making this stuff, but then dispersing again. And so uh, to overquote here, uh, so, you know, what, Graeber and Wengrow are saying is that if you look at the Ice Age sites where they have these extraordinary burials or the monumental and or the monumental architecture, they are like these societies uh, which are which not which Levi Strauss described about the Nambiquara, which are foraging for a lot of the year or at some times gathering together in these concentrated settlements. So what they're saying is that the people that built these monumental structures that we're finding more of as we go along uh, were indeed, were not agriculturalists, or they probably were part-time part -time farming and part-time uh, foraging, foraging bands or part-time getting, uh, um, going into these, these settlements. Um, actually, I told you in the last class that I was, was interested to see where this was, given that this was the epicenter of the, you know, devastating earthquakes that have uh, killed thousands of people in, in southern Turkey and northern Syria. Um, the last I read, the Gobekli Tepe site, although it was in the zone, was not not destroyed or affected by the earthquake, but some very significant archaeological sites have been in this area. It's, you know, really obviously very interesting area archaeologically, um, but has been in, in a bit of trouble lately. Um, and they say that this is also like, helps us to explain what was going on at a perhaps even more famous site, uh, Stonehenge. Anybody ever been there? No, me either. Heard it's cool. <laughs> yeah. I have heard it's cool. We've heard of that one, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there have been a lot of explanations and ideas proposed of this because this is in, uh, in England. Um, but one of the things that I was most interested about is that uh, Raber and Wengro say that they... The people who built Stonehenge were, they say on page 105, were not farmers or not in the usual sense. They had once been, but they uh, they turned their backs on uh, cultivating cereals and just started collecting hazelnuts instead. So they kept their they kept their pigs and their cattle, but they stopped planting uh, planting cereals that they had once been planting. So. Uh, during this period, they were not really farmers, but they were have these seasonal gatherings as well. So Graver and Wengrow says that at the time that Levi Strauss was writing, uh, anthropologists in general were very into the idea of seasonality. And they talk about another super famous, uh, even older than Levi Strauss, uh, anthropologist Marcel Moss. And uh, the, his book, Seasonal Variations of the Eskimo. And so what they're saying here is that uh, this was not an unusual idea in some of the early anthropology. And so uh, they write that, they're, that what Levi Strauss was doing was not necessarily commenting on something that was unusual. He was just simply 
uh, extending the political ideas uh, further than they had before. So what Levi Strauss was saying is that uh, you had these seasonal variations of social structure and being able to be uh, politically free. So they make a couple of points about why, why that's the case. Uh, one of them is that you could see different social or political structures during different kinds of years. So you would become familiar with different kinds of things. And so that gave you the ability to experiment with different kinds of social structures from time to time. And there's something else that comes up here. If you're seasonally shifting between a more hierarchical society and a more egalitarian society, you might say, what might, why might that limit the ability of chiefs or leaders to impose their will upon other people. Let's put it this way. Let us say that every two weeks, we shifted who the professor was. And every two weeks, you get a grade from one of you I'd get a grade from one of you. You'd shift around and you'd be in charge. What might that mean for how we treat each other? During my two weeks, how would I, would I what, how would you, how would I treat you or how would you treat me during your two weeks as boss? <laughs> yeah, okay. Or, yeah, but what kind of student? If I knew you were going to be my boss in two weeks, let us say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to give out anything arbitrary, right? I wouldn't want to give too many arbitrary orders because I knew that your turn is coming up in a couple of weeks and I might not want to, you know, be throwing around the bad grades, you might say. And so, you know, I mean, if you think about it, you don't want to, if you, if you know your boss is going to be somebody else pretty soon, or you're going to be, that person's going to be your boss, and that, you know, next summer, I'm going to be working for you. Um, you want to be be careful with that. So, again, for, uh, they say that, that what Levi Strauss was exploring here among the Nambiquara was this idea that we can see different societies, and thus it made us uh, link these ideas to political freedom. They then go into uh, uh, Robert Lowy's work on the Crow, uh, a Native American uh, in the in the in the U.S. Midwest. Uh, I found it immediately interesting that they they were also people who had once been farmers and. Uh, then uh, they abandoned cereal agriculture. They re-domesticated, escaped Spanish horses, and then started basically uh, hunting buffalo and being uh, being more pastoralists, and hunters and uh, and nomadic pastoralists in the plains. Uh, so I guess what was interesting to me is we had it within the space of three pages people who had once been farmers. And then decided, nah, I don't like that. I would like to be a herder, or I'd like to be a a, a, a hunter gatherer instead, um, which shouldn't happen, right? I mean, the idea that people, the idea of the evolutionary stages is, is once you have farming, you're not gonna, you're not gonna give it up. It's supposed to be great, right? It's supposed to be your next stage of evolution. And at least in here, we have two cases of people who decided that. Cereal farming wasn't a great idea. But one of Lowy's points is that during certain times of year, especially during the buffalo hunt, certain clans had basically almost authoritative or coercive force over others. But this was only during the specific times when they were hunting buffalo, and it also rotated around different groups uh, from year to year or from season to season. And so what they say here 
is that you know what Lowy was talking about are societies that didn't didn't fit the model that people were between went from bands to tribes to chiefdoms to states. This was a group that a lot of the year was a band, and then all of a sudden you'd have this very coercive police force come in and act like a state with a monopoly on coercive violence. So again, another society that like the non don't fit into this evolutionary model. And so they make a pretty bold claim here is that uh, the idea that our science or our scholarship is always going forward, it doesn't advance, or I mean, it is always advancing, that it doesn't always advance. And that we once in anthropology knew about these different social forms that people would alternate during different times of year, not just what they were planting and harvesting, but their very social organization would change uh, by the seasons. And so Gray Room One Grower is saying that we lost that idea, that for Levi Strauss, that it would have been an assumption, but the neo-evolutionist model of bands to foragers to, I mean, uh, bands to tribes, to chieftains, to states, um, has kind of was, was a step backwards in terms of how we look at political organization. And they also say that although we know that the bands to tribes to chieftains to states model doesn't exactly fit the evidence, there hasn't been another model proposed. There hasn't been an alternative proposed to what, uh, to what goes on. So in my intro class, I try a little bit to interrupt them. So I tell them that about this foraging bands, tribes, chiefs, and states model. And then I've always said that, you know, these are, these are points on a continuum. These are on a scale. Like you shouldn't get too excited about these as some sort of evolutionary schema. And I tell them that people go back and forth between these societies as whole groups so that they are, they are they're, they're not completely set in stone and that individuals can move between them and that there is uh, plenty of trading and interaction back and forth. So I've always told my intro class this, but the problem is that again, there is not an alternative proposed to these kinds of things. So this year in intro, I then tried to sell them on the book we're reading. I said, hey, you guys in intro. And there they were at 8.40 a.m. on Tuesday, Thursday. You'd think they could take this class because it's even later in the day. So I tried to sell them on this class. I said, hey, we're going to be talking about seasonality, about how these groups change, and that they're how these things are experiments, but not inevitable. I gave them the chance, but you know what? Nobody in intro wanted to come over to this class. I can't believe it. Some of them wanted to come over into cultural ecology. Liz knows them, but not here. Couldn't convince them. Anyway, I also give them this crazy diagram that I made up of like different things flowing into each other and alternating and civilizations coming up and going and going away. And I tell them that's all going to be on the exam. So I try to do something that at least makes it confusing, but I don't think it, it, it provides a complete alternative to what this idea that bands, tribes, chiefsums, and states describe our system. They then talk about uh, a person I, that I think they like, uh, Pierre Clastra and uh, his book Society Against the State and uh, Clastra was in the, a group around Levi Strauss but got kicked out for what do they say for the unauthorized use of official stationery um, no he was actually an anarchist I guess that was the official reason why he was kicked out of his research group um, but his idea was to kind of take the, the chiefs of the Nambiquara thing further and say that people organized themselves because they, they wanted to, um, they, 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 were, they were concerned that state power 
would come into their societies. And so they organized their societies in such a way that no one would ever be able to have this power. And so they're obviously very interested in, in, in his work and how uh, you know, he, he made the claim that, that people were very self-consciously organizing their societies to have a society that was against this idea of state or state government. But they also say that he basically left out the idea of seasonality. And they are unsure why he left that out, because he seems to have been familiar with the seasonality literature. In fact, he was very familiar with Lowy's work as well as uh, Levi Strauss. And it would have been an obvious idea for why people would try to organize themselves against state coercion if they were all already familiar with things like the Buffalo police or these. They already had those forms within their societies and could look at them and decide, no, we don't want those full time. But they say he left out seasonality and in so doing, he kind of, they, they said it was the, the final nail in the coffin of the earlier tradition and so everybody is stuck in this state of uh, uh, of being in a in a band, a tribe, a chiefdom, or a state. They ask why he left out seasonality, and uh, one of the reasons they say is that seasonality is confusing. It's hard to hard to know what season it is. It might be snowing on your bird feeder. Um, that's to say that, you know, to have these groups that seem to be alternating between band societies and state societies or alternating between uh, hunting and gathering and farming, um, it, it's hard to know what time of year all these things. There's not these clear patterns that you can point to. But they say that it's important because it brings up a, a completely different question, that if people didn't have one set pattern that they were alternating, that they'd make these coercive police forces, but then take them down. Then it brings up a different question, which is not how did we get unequal? That inequality was potentially always there, but how do we get stuck in one different social arrangement? Now they say that we already, we still have hints of seasonality uh, in our life in the winter or in the summer. So they talk about how there's, you know, the, the Christmas season in which all of a sudden all these companies tell us that now we should be thinking about giving presents to the people we care about and, and that kinship matters more than anything else. Um, but it may be do, it may be wonder about seasonality and the seasonality of your lives. What do you think is more hierarchical in your life? It has been more hierarchical in your life as a student, the school year or the summer? What do you think, Gabe? The school year is more hierarchical. Why? <laughs> so in the summer, do you still experience summer as freedom? Yeah. Pretty much? For now. For now. <laughs> yeah. Coming up on, I know, we're coming up on the end of things. What do you think, Liz? Summer freedom, school year hierarchy? Agreed? Okay, I'm relieved to hear that. I feel like, I feel like some of that has been lost from students' lives because oftentimes in the summer, you'll have to go work at a job where it might become even more hierarchical than school. Or, I don't know, I feel like now all these people are like, oh, summer, you gotta go research. You got to go get ahead. You got to go get an internship and like do all the, I feel like summer's, freedom of summer is diminishing. Well, I'm glad to hear it. So we still have these hints of seasonality, maybe during the winter, during the, the break time, we're having one now. 
or during the summer when we have that freedom. So they talk here about how that seasonality is, a hint of it is preserved in these seasonal rituals and festivals. And what they say is some rituals are experienced as order. So when you go to, you know, let us say a, a wedding or a funeral, everybody has to sit in a certain place and 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 your the family hierarchy is very preserved. And so sometimes ritual is experienced as a form of imposing social order. But there's other times when it's like crazy. It's like, okay, well, we had the wedding and now it's going to be a crazy party and everybody's going to go wild. Or, yeah, we had this thing, but now there's going to be a big feast. And so the ritual itself is this kind of uh, overturning of the social order. And then they reference something which we talked about uh, a little bit a couple chapters ago is there's this been this debate about whether festivals, especially those up in the world festivals, were more about blowing off steam so that you could go back to normal life, or were they times in which people really did upset the social order? They say that this debate, which has been around for a long time, I remember having this debate back when I was in college, they said it's centuries old, is not very enlightening. And that what's most important about these rituals and festivals is that they preserve our ability to think differently about the social order, to imagine different ways of organizing the world. So it's not necessarily that people were actually enacting these, but in these festivals in which, okay, you're the king for a day, or Mardi Gras and everything's upside down for a day, or men dressing like women and all different kinds of social orders, what it does is it helps us preserve that seasonality and a ability to imagine different political and social forms. So they end chapter three by saying that what's it most important about humans is our ability, our capacity to negotiate between these alternatives, to be able to see them, to talk about them, to understand, to be able to structure our society in different ways. And so what they want us to get away from is the idea that, you know, oh, people are naturally good or naturally live in these small scale societies or the alternative people are naturally bad and we need police, et cetera. They want us to get away from this idea of any one form being human nature and instead think about life as what they call a carnival parade of political forms that they could be one thing one part of the year and then during the winter you'd go and be very hierarchical and during the summer you'd have pretty much freedom and so that basically in different societies, there was no one basic human pattern, that there were all kinds of different ways of doing things. And then if we look at this time of the ice age, it's where we can see uh, evidence for all these different ways of organizing ourselves. And we see it in the, in the anthropological record as well. And they say here then, the question is not necessarily the origin of inequality, because we can see inequality in these different forms or the origin of hierarchy, but how we stopped having that alternation, how we stopped, uh, how we basically all became uh, similarly hierarchical state societies all over. And so they then ask, well, was it because of the adoption of agriculture? Was it because of settled life in cities and towns? Was it because of the advent of private property being able to fence off your particular land or your particular stuff? And they end the chapter with those, those questions leading up to into chapter four. 